What's up, guys? It is Friday morning, or almost Friday morning. It's Thursday night, but by the time we're done, it will be Friday morning. We are streaming late. We got breaking news. Matthew Pose is here. He went over to Massimo Consumer, formerly known as Sound United. He was invited there. We were invited there last week to check out their products, to do a tour of their facility, to get all the latest and greatest information on Den and Morantz and all the other brands that are under that umbrella. Today, we're going to be focusing on the Den and Morantz brands. We're going to be talking about their flagship models. We're going to be giving you engineering details on these products. You're not going to get on any other channel. We spoke to the engineers that designed these products. I'm getting in the separates in the next couple of weeks, so I'm going to be doing bench tests on those shortly. Matthew's going to be getting in some of those products as well. How was the trip, Matt? How did you enjoy visiting their facility? Uh, their facility is awesome. So they have a, a pretty modern look. We have some pictures of it we'll show in a second, but they have a pretty modern looking um, office building. And then we got in there, they took us over to this area where the demo rooms were and they have like a little education area. Everything's just decorated really nicely. I like that modern aesthetic, so I was into it. They have a ton of different listening rooms. A bunch of them are just like smaller offices. I think probably let's say 12 by 15 feet, something like that, that were turned into to mostly two channel or small, let's say five channel or five point, you know, five point one point two, something like that type rooms. But they had a fairly sizable, I, I have it written down in my notes, but they had a pretty sizable primary two channel listening room um, that was definitely bigger than what most people would have. And then they have a big theater um, and, and that, uh, we did a bunch of the surround listening in there. So it was cool to see what they've got. Everything was treated. They actually were using a lot of the acoustic treatments that I sell. Uh, Snow Sound is one of the brands that I carry that I mm. think looks really cool. And they had a bunch in there. And actually, a lot of the people that were there from the press were like, what are those cool things on the wall? And I'm like, those are acoustic treatments. And I have some. So, awesome. Yeah, anyway, we need to get into it, though, so we can show everybody what uh, what I learned. Yeah, so let me give a full screen here, and then we'll switch back and forth but so that's their entrance right that's when you walk it into is, the yeah so that that you can see the modern aesthetic to it there it still says sound united <laughs> they haven't, they haven't mm -hmm. uh chiseled that off yet but um you can see on that right wall there there's a bunch of tv displays and then those black circles are speakers so they look like i believe they're poke audio car audio speakers and there's just like a hundred of them just surrounding it they weren't like playing music or anything through it actually i shouldn't say that i think there was a little bit of music playing but um, yeah, I think it was mostly for decoration. Oh, okay. All right. So two-day Massimo press event. Uh, it was a pretty select group of audio press that were brought mm -hmm. uh, out to the Carlsbad, California Massimo headquarters. So there wasn't a lot of press. Um, I was actually not sure how many people to expect. I kept asking. They wouldn't tell me. And I don't remember exactly how many, but like less than 10, I think, total people uh, were brought out for this, which makes sense. You know, it was a big deal for them to bring us all out. Yeah. Uh, so there's uh, Brian from eAcoustics there, um, and um, oh my gosh, it's hard to see. It's dark. No, no, no. I <laughs> hold on, you guys. I have to look this up because I can't believe I'm like drawing a, such a, a Todd. That's right, Todd Anderson um, from AV Nirvana, who I used to write with. Like that's why I'm, I'm kick, uh, kicking <laughs> myself right now that I forgot his name. But it's uh, just it's late. I'm gonna go with that. So um, I thought that was a cool picture. The two of them were just chatting. I had never met Brian before in person. I've met Yeah, he's a cool Todd dude. Before. He's a really nice guy. He was. He wrote me afterwards to stay in touch, and he, he was a really nice guy. Um, so for those of you who uh, are, are wondering what this Massimo business is, Massimo bought up Sound United. And so now what was called Sound United before is called specifically Massimo Consumer. So if you see something that says Massimo Consumer, that refers to the audio brands. Massimo is actually a health sensor company. So they make things like those uh, sensors that read the blood oxygen levels that are used primarily in hospitals. So they don't really do a lot of home stuff, but I think it sounds like that's their goal. So one mm -hmm. of the things we did learn actually is that they are looking to incorporate um, some of the interconnectivity, think of it as Internet of Things type interconnectivity of their sensors into uh, these devices. So HEOS actually had its firmware updated so that it can now act as a Bluetooth to Wi-Fi, basically modem for all those devices so that data can be collected as you walk around your house. Uh, so are they, they going to monitor your heart rate when you're watching a movie to see the reaction you're getting to the Yeah, they, I think they could. I don't think that was the intent, but yeah, they probably could do interesting things like that. I think the real intent was more about um, creating an environment where you can have these very low power devices that you would be wearing 
and it would be collecting health data on you all the time if you wanted to. So there was one person who was like, I can turn that off, right? And they're like, yeah, of course. Um, but if this is something you wanted to do, it just provides a greater interconnectivity. That was not the focus of this. We're not gonna be talking about health devices. It's just something they happened to mention. So they flew us out, put us up, fed us a lot of food. They nice. interviewed us on the new products, which was cool. And they demoed this stuff. I, when I say till we passed out, I mean, at the end of each day, I literally just wanted to climb in bed and go to sleep. Um, typically around nine o'clock, I was ready. Now, admittedly, different time zones, so that didn't help. Um, I think one of the biggest takeaways, which I, okay, it surprised me. So maybe all of you are going to say, oh, no, this doesn't surprise me. Massimo or Sound United is one of the largest AV companies there is. And so... I think that sometimes we look at companies like that more as like the big corporate, like the man version of the AV business, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I think then we assume that they're not necessarily into this stuff. That is not what we experienced at all. These guys, every one of them are super passionate about audio and video. Uh, the guys that were giving us demos would talk about the music that they're playing for us in ways that were more similar to what I would get at like, an audio club or something, you know, it's like the, these were guys that were just really into it. And I think that's why they do this for a living. So that passion is true of the engineers and Gene, you knew, you know, a bunch of the engineers for Marantz and yep. Yep. I, I had never met any of these guys before. So it was neat to meet them and hear their passion and, and talk about their history with this stuff. So I would just say for those of you who've questioned, you know, how, let's just say how into music these guys are, I think as much and more so, than any group I've ever met before in this business. So there is a picture of a demo room now. I So we have a problem, guys. <laughs> I can't show you pictures, detailed pictures of the demo rooms because one of the products in particular, or a line of products that we're gonna share with you in the future is under embargo. So we mm -hmm. can't talk about it, we can't share it, I can't tell you what it is, which means I can't show you pictures of the rooms because that product was in all the rooms. So this is a sidewall picture. Those are snow sound acoustic treatments. And for those of you who are wondering what they are, they're basically absorbers with a, in, in a cool pattern. They work very well, um, but they don't look like absorbers. So it's not I thought they were giant toilet seat covers. Well, yeah, you're not, you, you, you know, you have the taste of an old lady. So what can I say? <laughs> I would have never thought that was acoustic. Looks very thin, actually. They, well, they're not super thick, but that metal hanger actually spaces it from the wall. So they're about, I'd say, three quarters of an inch to an inch thick, and then they're spaced from the wall about an inch, inch and a half. So in total, you get the equivalent absorption of like a two inch panel. And they're roughly, let's say, three or four feet in diameter, something like that uh, mm -hmm. each. So, you know, it's not as good as you're going to get from a, let's say, four inch thick fiberglass panel that's, you know, two feet by two feet or four feet by four feet or whatever, but it doesn't look like an acoustic panel and it still has good absorption over a relatively wide range and they make different products. So if you need more deeper absorption, they make products like that. The material is very dense too. So it does absorb better than the thickness would suggest. All right. But this is not what we're here to talk about. All right. So I had a lot of fun. Uh, Gene didn't approve of my yellow sweater. That sweater, man. <laughs> yeah, he, he, I sent him this picture. Actually, no, I sent him a different one that I couldn't put up here because yeah. um, Jerry decided to to throw some hand signs that are not appropriate. He's an, he's an, he's an Italian. What do you expect? He's like yeah. me. But uh, I said, little little does Gene know, my pants were bright red. Oh, my God. So, so the whole outfit was actually a little bit McDonald's looking. It was not intentional. Uh, I had a great time, though, meeting the whole team. The other journalists were a lot of fun. A lot of these people I've talked to online uh, by email, but I'd never met them in person. So that was that was good. And there's others who I, I do know and I've met before. And so it was good to spend time with them. There you go. See, I'm not alone here with the toilet seat covers, but let's let, we're digressing. <laughs> For sure. Um, oh, and I had a nice break from the kids. My wife gave me such a hard time when Jean asked me if I'd come out and do this, um, yeah. about how I was sticking her with the kids. But I got to say, Three days a piece was nice. I bet. All right. So let's start with, well, I don't know why I did this one. It put up there. Sorry about the uh, T falling over to the next line there, but the new product announcement from Denon. Um, we learned A1H. about the, A, the A1H. Yeah. So um, this is their new flagship receiver. It's top of line model, obviously. It has a lot of new features. Um, within Denon's design, uh, This I would call this more evolutionary. Um, whereas some of the other things that, that we kind of saw were maybe more revolutionary. So what I mean by that is that, you know, the amplifier module, for instance, it's a new amplifier module. 
but it's not like class D. We actually were wondering if we were going to see that. No, it's a class AB module. They're sticking to their roots. That's what for them is best. And that's what they wanted to do. And on the other hand, you know, that, that module put out a ton of power. It's the, we'll get actually, I'm not, I'm getting ahead of myself. So is this module different than the, um, the 8,500, the 13 channel, or is it the same one? So I, unless I misunderstood, it's a new module. Um, okay. and I think I have some of that here. <clears throat> so this thing is priced at $6,499, which is definitely flagship pricing. That's expensive for a receiver, but Gene, you've talked about this before. Like a lot of times people think of processors as being like the high end and receivers are cheap yeah. and, and the quality is worse. Denon has on and off over the years introduced flagship receivers that are basically like separates in one box. I mean, they have, they're actually pretty good. The technical yeah. performance is very good. The amplifiers are actually pretty potent. So this thing is 15 channels at 150 watts a channel into eight ohms. We actually saw the, I can't show it, unfortunately, but we're going to measure this when we get one in to, to actually see how it does. But we saw their own bench tests and their internal bench tests actually showed this thing doing more like 175 watts. Now that was probably one or two channels driven. I wouldn't, the 150, I believe is so they can guarantee that for, I think it's what, five, five channels driven. Yeah. Well, the reason why you got 175 times two is it has one centralized, very large centralized power supply. It's a linear power supply. So you've got a lot of reserves on tap. This thing will easily do that 175, two channels driven, probably close to double that at four ohms for one or two channels driven as well. And I, I think the point being, it's an impressively powerful amplifier for a receiver. I mean, that's pretty potent. We, mm -hmm. we typically see 80 to 100 watts, maybe 120 watts. Um, I didn't see the four ohm chart for this so i don't know what it is but you know in general they've done pretty good in the past so i would say this thing's probably doing what do you think 250 in the four at least yeah. yeah oh yeah um you know yeah it'd be nice to see it do 300 watts but i don't think i've ever seen a receiver double its power into four ohms before uh, 5805 did but that was a different breed yeah i don't and know if this went well yeah well we'll see you know we're gonna i think we're gonna try to get one in for review we've been talking about that Yep. Um, so it's got 8K on all inputs. So as, as many know, the last uh, flagship product they brought out had 8K, but it was only, I think, on one or two inputs. I think it was one yep. of the inputs was. And there was issues with it. They had to give everybody an outboard device to let you use it. Um, it supports up to 9.4.6. Uh, 9 so it has 19 discrete channels of output, but 16 of those are renderable. So what they're doing is taking the 0.1 LFE channel, and essentially giving you four of those on the out, but they're each discrete and you can, you can uh, adjust each one. And there's, this is a reason why they're doing that. This is actually an important shift for them. So someone said it must be 50 or 60 pounds. Actually, this is closer to 80 pounds. It's one of the heaviest amps, one of the heaviest receivers they made. Yeah. And somebody else is asking how many Watts would it do if you hook up eight ohm speakers to every channel? So I think this is something that, um, you know, we, I've not tested it. They certainly didn't, but it would be a little bit ridiculous to assume that the receiver would ever be putting out full power to all, uh, 15 of its channels. Like it, that's just not a realistic scenario. So very yeah. likely in that scenario, it's not going to do anywhere near the 150 Watts. It's probably going to be, it's limited to the wall current. I mean, yeah. this, realistically, if, it, if this is a 15 amp device, it'll probably get close to that at max power, maybe 12 or 13 amps. So just do the math on that and divide it by the number of channels. And that's what you're going to get. Right. But, you know, in all likelihood, you're really only going to be driving heavy into the front three channels. Right. The rest of the channels are probably not going to be driven nearly as heavily, especially the Atmos uh, speaker channels. Um, and so probably it's not a big deal. It definitely is going to be able to put its full power out to those front three channels, even driving a you know modest amount to the others. Now, so they claim it's the largest power transformer they've ever used. I'm assuming they mean the largest single transformer because the 5805 actually had a toroid and two e-cores, and that was a bigger power supply overall uh, for the 10-channel beast that that thing was. But I'm assuming they, they mean this is the largest e-core they've ever put in an AV receiver. That could be true. They didn't specify, so I don't know. Um, I think it weighs 25 pounds, their e-core. Yeah. yeah using it. It's a beast, yeah. But they, okay, so what they told us was it's the largest power transformer they've ever used in a Denon receiver. Um, the, the capacitors are interesting. If you're somebody who's into like high-end DIYing, you're going to know what these parts are. 
And I just think it's kind of cool that like their standard product that they're using for their power supply capacitors are what a lot of us would upgrade to when we were trying to improve a product. So they're using a four pole capacitor. It's basically what they've done is they've changed the, the way that the windings are tapped inside the electrolytic capacitor so that there's an input side and an output side. And it creates a four pole filter. And by doing that, it dramatically reduces the inductance of the capacitor. Um, and so it, it allows you if, you, if you look up like these tech sheets on how these things work, they basically say, we're not really constrained by the ESR anymore. It's more the transfer impedance of the overall capacitor, which is significantly better than normal. So like oh, their wow. standard capacitor is actually like a high end audiophile type capacitor. Like that's what they've chosen to use on this product. Hmm. Um, I already mentioned that the, uh, amplifier modules are new. So one of the things that was different about it is that they pointed out there's four pins on a FET. So everybody knows transistors have three pins. Um, so the fourth pin, and some of you are going to already be familiar with these parts is that there's a built-in thermistor. And by including that and adding that into the circuit, it can basically track the voltage, uh, on a pretty constant basis and it can adjust the bias or whatever it needs to do, uh, to make sure that everything stays as it's supposed to be nice, clean power, even as the amp heats up. So that was one of the things that they pointed out. I'm assuming that's new because they pointed it out to us as if it was, but Eugene, you asked if it's different from before. I mm -hmm. guess I don't know. I didn't ask. I just thought that's what they were telling us. Um, it's a, it's a BV amplifier. As I said, they showed us a, a power chart that actually looked like it was doing about 175 Watts at 0.1% THD. Um, I mean, I would say that 150 was actually closer to the point where the inflection first happens, where it first starts to dip up. So clipping is just coming on and right. distortion was pretty low. Uh, again, I think we'll have to test it to really know for sure. Mm -hmm. So real quick, someone's asking a good question. What's the advantage of having a Marantz AV10 as a preamp compared to the A1H? If you're going to go separates, so obviously the advantage there is uh, you're not wasting money on an amplifier section. The processor is going to run, you know, uh, cooler and you're not going to have any noise components from the amplifiers in there. And then you have the ability to put a much more powerful amplifier, at least for your front three channels, if you need that. And you've got balanced XLR outputs on the Marantz, whereas you don't. I think the Denon might have the two channel balanced outputs. Four. Right? So it's got four channels okay, of four. balanced outputs. They're designed for the subwoofers, but you can reassign them. So you could in fact reassign two of them, for instance, for the front two channels. So right. I, I think we need to get these two on the bench to really know. Yeah. And Marantz is going to have the HDM, you know, which we can debate if that's a good thing or not. Mm. Um, the, the Denon does not, but I believe, and I'd like to test it, I guess, to be certain of this, but I believe that the Marantz has a significantly higher voltage output. Well, so, definitely a, out of the XLR outputs, but, but then yeah, again, the, it, Denon, the Denon has that too. So you have to compare apples to apples if we're going to do that. I know. So yeah, that's, I, I think that that's why I said, we got to get this thing on the bench to really know. Sure. So that's the amps. I just wanted to show you a picture of it so you could see, I mean, it's pretty, and you can see the copper. So they pointed out that copper plate. They didn't want yeah. to do that. It was expensive. But when they first designed the whole thing and it didn't have the copper plate, they ended up having issues where they just couldn't, as they put it, evacuate the heat fast enough away from the amplifiers, uh, mm -hmm. that output devices. And so in order to keep heat well managed, they had to add a copper plate uh, before the aluminum heat sink. So that's a nice little detail you don't see from their competitors. Like I've looked at similar uh, receivers from other brands and I don't ever see them putting that on a heat sink, coupling it right to the amplifier. So that's pretty interesting. Yeah, they definitely were paying attention to the details. So this is the power supply. There's the large transformer. Um, wow, six fans? Wow. Yeah, well, and the amps sit over that. So you've got the 15 yeah. channels of amplification that would sit over that. And what they pointed out, which has been my experience when I bench tested these, those fans will pretty much never come on. In fact, they're primarily there for UL ratings. Like basically mm -hmm. they have to be there to be able to pass the UL. Under normal usage, they said, you're, you're probably going to never hear them. And when I bench tested amps, what I've noticed is that under most of the testing conditions, the fans don't come on. It's only when I start doing either the highest power 8 ohm or higher power 4 ohm testing that I hear it come on. And they usually just zip on really quick and then go off unless I sustain yeah. the output for a long time. In, in use, I mean, I was doing this once with a, I think it was like a Pioneer receiver. And I remember... I could get the fans to come on with testing, but every time I used it, I never heard them come on. 
Yeah, I've I've seen the same thing. A bench test make them trip. And the thing is, they're using six of them, so it is even distribution of airflow. They're probably not spinning very fast, so they're yeah. not going to be very loud. Yeah, I and, and certainly in our use with this device, which admittedly was in a large home theater or large theater demo room, I should say, uh, we never heard them come on. There were other more significant noises. Okay, so that's the the Denon. We're going to get into some more features of it, but they're common with Moran. So I want to get into the Morants and then we'll talk about the common features. So this is the new flagship. So one of the things we learned is that as part of their long-term plan is they want to move Morants up market. And so they're going to start to introduce more of these higher end products like this. So this is the new flagship. This is meant to be higher end than anything that they've introduced before. This is a 16 channel. Again, it's 15.1 or 16 renderable channels, but 19 discrete output channels. Uh, it is, as I said, it's moving Marantz up market. The focus was on better sound and better measured performance as compared to any other prior or current Marantz denim piece. The measurements they showed us seem to imply that that's true. Now, again, we need to get it on the bench to see. Uh, there was definitely a new degree of setup flexibility. So this thing had more capabilities in terms of what you could do with setup than I've seen in the past. And a lot of it was exciting. Um, they had the IP, you could log into to the device through the IP address and set it up. Now you've been able to do that for a while, but you can do a lot more now than you used to be able to do. It used to be pretty limiting. Oh, that's cool. Um, it's not competitive with a Storm or a Trinoff. So, you know, for anybody who was hoping this was going to be a $7,000 processor that equals a, uh, you know, $18,000. Yeah. yeah, it's just, it's not that good. It doesn't have those kinds of capabilities, but it is a lot better than anything they've had before and better, I think, than other products in a similar class that I've seen. Well, let's qualify that too. So not everybody needs a Storm or a Trinov if they don't no. go beyond 16 channels and they don't need super advanced base management. But the fact that this thing has way more advanced HDMI than a Storm or a Trinov speaks volumes for the fact that they're doing that at a price at a third of what those guys are doing. Yeah, and but, it actually wouldn't shock me if it's got you know essentially better, more stable HDMI in oh, perception than than the Storm yeah. or the Trinov would. Yeah, they're probably not gonna like me saying that, but I just you know at the end of the day, Marantz is part of a large company that the we'll talk about this in a little bit, but the HDMI board on this is actually pretty special. And it was it was co-designed between the Marantz team and the Denon team. So they were able to join resources for that, meaning that there was a lot put they, I mean they just get first access to these chipsets. They get priority access. They have a lot of engineering power. I mean we're talking we aren't talking like 50 or 60 or 100. We're talking about 500 plus engineers. So there's a lot mm -hmm. that goes into this. Yeah, I mean, think about it. This Trinov currently doesn't have an HDMI 2.1 board, and you're spending thirty thousand dollars on a processor that has yesterday's HDMI. Yep. Yeah, if you're really hardcore into gaming, you know, and that was one of the things they pointed out. This one was designed to work well with current gaming systems, and they made it specifically so that people who have two or three different systems with with 8K capabilities could, in fact, plug into this. Mm -hmm. So, somebody, I want to address this real quick because this is probably something worthy of another video topic. I don't like when people assume that a toroid is better than an e-core because they could potentially both be equally good for different applications. There's advantages and disadvantages to both. Toroids tend to hold the flux density inside the unit more so it doesn't let out as much magnetic coupling around it. But at the same time, it allows more DC hum to come in than a than typically than a uh, e-core. E-cores tend to block the DC hum better. Also, in this case with the Denon, um, I don't think they could have fit a large enough toroid in the space that they had so they had to go with a form factor for a power transformer that would fit that mold of that unit so don't don't discount it because it's got an e-core there's incredibly good e-core transformer designs out there and i just wanted to well and i think at the end of the day it's it's a proof is in the pudding type thing if the thing measures good yeah who cares it, right yeah. so if the power supply is doing its job then who cares what part they used that's more yeah. about the end engineering uh, they wonder about DAC chips. You're going to find out. So just just wait. <laughs> so there, as I mentioned, there's a lot of common parts between the Morans and the Denon, and we'll talk about what those are. There's unique power supply designs. They're different. So the Morans has a linear power supply for the audio section, uh, switching supply for the non-audio related parts. That's true of the AV10. Uh, we actually learned just before we went online that that is not how the amp works. We were a little bit mixed up, and we've gotten that straightened out. Um, it's got balanced and single-ended outputs for all channels. Now, one thing I learned, I was a little disappointed, but again, I think from a measurement standpoint, this probably doesn't matter. It's inherently a single-ended design. So what they're doing is 
They're just using a single DAC chip per channel. They're not mm -hmm. using two and creating a differential output. What they're doing is converting the single ended output to a differential output with just a little uh, basically circuit at the end there that can do that. Noise wise, this thing is better than the 8805 by quite a bit actually. Um, again, this is based on their measurements, but their measurements have typically jived well with other independent measurements. So yeah, I've always I've always been able to confirm their measurements when I do my own stuff. Yeah, so ba if that based on that, I saw a direct comparison, and that direct comparison definitely showed a substantial improvement uh, over the 8805. Now they're not getting rid of the 8805 for those who are wondering. This is meant to be a higher end product than that. That product is going to stay around. Um, one of the other things that changed is this is a new. Um, industrial design for them. A lot of you guys already know that. And I like it. I actually think it's a very attractive design. Mm -hmm. I did not realize, and, and the thing that's so sad is I have the first product that they introduced this design on. I'm forgetting it's something Model 40. Is that what it was? Model 40N, I think, was the first one. That this the SACD on. player or the integrated amp? The integrated amp. Oh, okay. um, yeah. And uh, I thought the whole thing was aluminum. Apparently, I didn't pay very close attention. The outer part there with that cool, what looks like kind of a milled finish is actually plastic. But mm. we were joking, like, you can't call it plastic. You got to call it some sort of luxurious uh, polymer material or something. So they need a better name for it. But, you know, again, at the end of the day, it looks good. It gets the job done. Um, and, and I think it allows them to provide a higher end looking finish without spending what it would cost to actually have a high end finished piece of aluminum. That would be hard to finish. All right, let's see. It's, talk, it's talking about the transformer, the E-Core. Just uh, follow up there. Yeah, Thanks, I, that wouldn't shock me if space was an issue. I will say there was a lot of practical engineering decisions that were being made for both of these products. And it makes sense. You know, yes, they're very high end from a cost standpoint. But when we talk to them about, you know, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? A lot of it came down to them saying things like, well, look, you got to remember, this thing has to fit in a 19-inch uh, wide chassis. That's only, you know, they're not willing to make this thing 10 units high. So it's got to be only, what is it, four units high, something like that? Mm -hmm. It can only be so deep. Uh, the Denon one actually is uh, deeper than most of their products have been in the past. So it won't fit in a lot of racks because of that. You would need an extra deep rack. E even the big full-size pro racks like Gene and I use, they were, they were telling everybody, make sure you get the deep one. I think you need a 24-inch deep one or something like that mm -hmm. to hold it. And it's so heavy that they said you have to use the four-post style uh, shelves. Yeah. So um, obviously the AB10 is not quite that heavy. That's not as much of an issue, but they were mentioning that they were very limited on space, you know, that that made it hard to put even more stuff in these. All right, so pictures. Um, that thing on the left there, uh, you can probably tell from the rear panel that's that everything's missing from, that actually is the AV-10, not the AMP-10, and that little, actually pretty big, turtle transformer and dual power supplies that are there um, are the power supply for it. And then on the right there, that's all the innards. Uh, what they actually told us was they took this thing apart for us right there. So they had one sent in. These are all made in Japan. Um, and they actually had to take it apart just to be able to show us all the parts there. And uh, there, you can see there's like a thing that has a ton of little boards coming off of it. Those are all of the um, discrete op amps, the HDMs that they HDM, use. Yeah. So there's, remember, there's 19 channels, which means they have to have 19 of those. So keep in mind, this is the processor. This isn't the amplifier. There's right. no amplification in this. This is just a pre-amplifier, and it has, still has a substantial power supply. And all those fans, is that all those fans for the HDMI boards, or are they for the? Oh, HDMI? the fans. So on the left there is the amp, and the right is the preamp. So the fans. Oh, okay. I'm looking at amp. a different chassis. Yeah, yeah. And, and the one on the right, the picture on the right there does have some of the amp parts on the table and some of the preamp parts. They were all kind of mixed up on the table. So mm -hmm. stuff towards the right is the preamp stuff. All right, so let's talk about that AMP-10. This is a totally new 16-channel amplifier. They refer to it as being an in-house design amplifier module built in their Japanese factory. It utilizes, however, the Ice Edge driver chipset and controller. So for those who are familiar with the Ice Edge chipset, you'll know there's a pretty common layout and reference design, and this one looked consistent. I'm sure there's lots of customizations they did to make it their own, um, including the parts that they chose to use but at the end of the day, the layout was very consistent, which is not a bad thing. The Ice Edge is actually a decent amplifier. Um, it's got 16 equal power channels, 200 watts per channel into eight ohms, 400 into four ohms. And actually you can do bridge tide load and that lets you get um, uh, 400 watts into eight ohm if you do the bridge tide loads. So you have to take a pair of them and put them together. The modules are actually a pair of amps with a power supply. That's one of the new things that we 
figured out. And let's see if we get this one right now. This is uh, not a single power supply. I meant to fix that. Sorry about that, guys. So there's not yeah, a single there's power a couple supply. Of, there's a couple of errors on this slide. So each power, each module has its own SMPS power supply that's rated at 500 watts. It'll do 200 watts a channel with five channels driven, not 70%. That's what I was just told by Phil Jones. And we're going to hold him to that because I'm going to be bench testing this. So anyone wondering about the all channels driven, you'll get, according to what I heard today, you'll get 200 watts times five with five channels driven. And then the 70% rule is when you bridge tie load. So you'll get the 400 watts times five, but 70% of that. So what is 70% of 400? What is it like 280 something watts? Let me get yeah, my calculator yeah, yeah. out here. 400 times 0. 0.7, 280 watts. I was right. I don't have to check my calculator. So you're going to get 280 watts times five, five channels driven and bridge tide load. That's a pretty substantial amount of power um, coming from this multi-channel amp. And again, I think that it's very unlikely that in practical use, you'd ever find yourself in a position where it's actually trying to drive even five channels to full power output. So I think in practice, you're gonna find that it's probably able to deliver more of its power to the channels that need it than what that rating would actually suggest. Yeah, um, and the, what I've, in my experience with Denon and Marantz, when they give you the 70% rule and they say with five channels driven, I've always been able to replicate that with seven channels driven. So they're again, being very conservative and I don't hold the power, I don't hold the line voltage constant. Like some, some people that do the tests in labs, I don't think that's a realistic way to test the amplifier. So I do a 20 amp line, even if it's a 15 amp product, I monitor the line voltage so it doesn't sag, you know, more than a couple of volts behind, below nominal, which is usually 120 volts. And I'm guessing that this thing is gonna do the 200 Watts definitely with five channels but close to that for seven channels we'll see i mean regardless this is more this amplifier is probably the most powerful multi-channel amp that they've ever done because they have class d efficiency now they're able to tap off more power with more channels driven than they were in the past with the linear amplifiers um, and I know there's somebody who's asking about using the NAD Purify module based amp versus this. So here's what I would say, guys. The ice power module is not as good as the Purify. It's not as clean. It doesn't have as low distortion or noise. Um, however, other ISA, so this one we haven't bench tested yet, but its specs suggest it's similar. Other ice edge amplifiers that I've seen measurements for have definitely seemed to have more current capabilities. And so not quite as clean, yes, but you know, like the Trinov uses Ice Edge on their new 16 channel amp, and that thing will do 600 watts into eight ohms if you bridge two channels together. It's got a lot more current, and this thing seems to be a pretty high current design as well, given that it's doubling its power into four ohms. So what I would say is it's not really apples to apples. I'm not even, you know, I love products that are over-engineered to these extremes, and at the same time, there's no preamp on the market that can even approach the noise of the Purify amplifier. And so because of that, having an even cleaner amplifier wouldn't really give you any benefit, but that extra power certainly could be nice, you know, if you need it. So mm -hmm. I, I think, I suspect the Ice Edge is probably substantially cheaper than the Purify modules are to produce. And that's probably why they went that route. Um, they're supposed to be pretty low heat. I know the Purify is good too, but they are supposed to be a pretty low heat design. So it's also possible that trying to stick 16 of them in a single uh, chassis like this, that there were some restrictions. I actually had gone down the road of, of talking to a couple of manufacturers about producing for me a custom 16 channel Purify based amplifier that used the 40 amp module. And they basically all came back and said, you can't stick it in a single chassis. <laughs> like it just can't be done. And it, heat was one of the big issues. Well, keep in mind when we're talking about clean, we're talking about bench test clean because when you get to this level of distortion, low level of distortion, yes, you can measure 110 or 120 dB sine and distortion out of the state of the art amplifier. This one might do 100 or 105, way beyond audibility. Let's keep things into perspective. Most class AB amplifiers aren't this clean. So we're looking at now, a, we're at the point now where we're getting class D amplification that meets or exceeds the very best linear amp AB designs. And now you're able to pack more channels into a single chassis. So you increase your channel density because you have a much more efficient design than you had in the past. 
Yeah. So Randy, by the way, makes a point that he, what he says is true, but it's not in this case. So he's saying uh, reducing noise is always beneficial because noise is cumulative. It is, but you got to remember when you take a signal that's 10 dBs and another one that's 3 dBs and you add them together, you don't get 13 dBs. Right. Uh, you get like 0.1 dB. So in this case, this amp is already substantially cleaner than the preamp. So adding it, even if you added a purify instead, you're talking about a fraction of a decibel of additional noise, if that. Yeah. Yeah, so, I can't wait to bench. I can't wait to bench this. It's been a while since I've tested ICE modules, and I know that I know Legacy Audio uses a similar ICE module to this. It's a very good amplifier. So it is. High yeah, it is. This is like when I say not as clean. I mean, you're talking about one of the absolute cleanest amplifiers on the on the market versus one that's also one of the absolute clean. I mean, it's still really, really clean. Yeah. All right. So uh, large power bus bars. Um, I, also, there's bus bars that are being used to go to the speaker terminals there new custom binding posts with a special key to tighten them. I made a joke about that because they're like, look at this really cool key. And I'm like, that's actually a good idea, but I'd probably lose it in a week. And they said, yeah. no, it's got a magnet on it so it can stick to the back of the amplifier chassis. And they showed us that. I'm like, I'd still lose it in a week. That's I'd pretty cool though. It is pretty cool. It, it was a very good idea, but knowing me, I'd end up finding it stuck to the bottom of my rack. You know, like- Well, just use banana stuff. plugs. Use compression banana plugs. Don't, who, would, who would terminate bare wire on 16 amplifiers? Uh, a, a masochist. Yeah, I wouldn't do it. So um, this has HDM S2 on all the inputs and the preamp had HDM S3. I think I forgot to mention that. Um, I don't know the difference. I know one's a different generation than the other, but I don't know why they went with S2 on this and S3 on the other. I don't know if there's um, issues that you know made this make sense, but for those who were, somebody made a comment to me once. They were like, so does that mean it's got some sort of like noise tuning going on. And I would just say that is how they described the HDM. They said that it was a, a part that allowed them to have a great deal of control over its design versus an op amp. And that it allowed them to tune the sound based on the, uh, uh, sound, the, the sound master that they have who kind of oversees how all the products are supposed to be done. So call that sound tuning if you want. Well, and I will tell you, I was just chatting with Shane from uh, Spare Change or Shane Lee, whatever his channel is now, and he has this amp in, and he said that his listening tests are basically saying it's a very warm sound and kind of a laid back sounding amplifier. So maybe that has something to do with the HDM circuit. It would make sense because I can't imagine that the Ice Edge module has much of a sound to it. It's a it's a pretty clean amp. It doesn't roll off the highs. Um, it's actually not particularly reactive. It's a little bit more reactive than the Purify, but only slightly, not enough to matter. Um, but the, the HDM we know from other tests that we've seen seems to actually be high in um, uh, second harmonic distortion, which would warm up the sound. And it's not yeah. like super high. I mean, they're trying to make I, it sound tubish. Yeah, and I saw the, the the measurements on this thing. I mean, when I say high, it, it, we're still talking like 0.0001% or something like that. It was very, very low distortion. It just happened to be maybe higher than it would be had they not used that. And I and I don't even know that that's true because we didn't test it. So, you know, we'll have to wait. Um, so, all right, so this is the, the new stuff that I put in. This is a, a picture of what the amp looks like. You know, that transformer on the right is not actually the transformer for the amp. It's actually the transformer that's used um, for that power supply that then goes to all the HDM boards, uh, as we understand it. I mean, if, if somehow we got this wrong, we'll, we'll update it in the future, but this is what we heard yeah. from, uh, their team directly, you know, as of an hour ago. And, uh, there's actually an SMPS that's used on each individual module mm -hmm. rated for 500 Watts, I think something like that. Yeah. And, um, it powers two amplifier channels. So essentially there's 16 amplifiers, which means there's eight power supplies. So that is better than originally I thought. And I think that's that pretty is. cool. We do think there's some current limiting going on because it can't actually produce as much power continuously as all those power supplies added up together would suggest. But that also would exceed a 15 amp output. Oh, yeah. So here's the interesting thing then, what, something we'll test. People are going to jump to the bridge tie load option. There's really very little benefit, um, excuse me, of using that if you're using a forum speaker. Because if you're using a forum speaker already, you're going to get 400 watts out of that module. The power supply is only capable of 500 watts continuous. So 
if you're using a forum speaker and you bridge tie it, it probably is not going to give you much more than 400 watts. It's got a current limit. It might give you yeah. maybe an extra 50 or 60 watts. That's what I'm guessing. Now, if, th if I'm wrong, I'll update it in the test report, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say, you're probably not going to get much more than 400, maybe 450 watts out of this module, each module. Yeah, exactly. All right. So now the HDMI DSP and DAC. We'll talk about that. This is a picture of the HDMI board. Look yeah, at those. That's a monster. Pieces. It is. It is. It was heavy. It's you don't get well that in a trade off. I'm sorry, Matt. You just don't get that in a trade off. I've never held the HDMI board, so I have no idea what's <laughs> in there. But I, I do think that this was a well engineered piece. They mentioned, I believe, this was one of the ones that has a three layer instead of a two layer uh, uh, board. So they they went to a more advanced design to improve yep. uh, the HDMI performance. You know, it produces a lot of heat, so it needed those heat sinks, but it does have the ability to handle all current formats. It was designed with gamers in mind, so I'm not a gamer, and I don't know all the things that it does that people need, but they assured us that it can do it, and, I, and I'm sure there's others out there who are more aware of all of that, but I know, like, higher frame rate, uh, HDL, things like that, all that was stuff that they mentioned it could do, which is pretty cool, and they made a big deal about making sure that. Somebody's asking if the Trinov and Stormer differential preamps. Yes, they are. And they do, do dual DACs per channel. Mm -hmm. All right. So it's HDCP 2.3 supports variable refresh rate, quick, quick frame transfer, and auto low latency mode. The DSP is a new one gigahertz chipset. It's significantly more powerful than before. Um, oh. uh, yes, it does 120 hertz VRR. Sorry, we mentioned that. Um, and they needed this in order to support the 19 channel. So somebody asked about the DAX. I said, we get to that. Um, and this is uh, common between both the Marantz and the Denon because they, they use the, they developed this together. So it uses the new ESS Sabre 9018 DAC chip. They're using the two channel version of it. And there's 10 of them in, to in total, which would give you 20 DAX. And we're, so we're suspecting they're using one per channel with one of them being unused. For all I know, the one's being used for something else like the headphone output or something, but. Yeah, good point. I didn't think of that. You might be right. Um, in any case, I was kind of hoping that there would be, you know, 20 DAX or something on there, uh, but that is not the case. Admittedly, that would have been massive. Yeah. Um, you think of back in the Den and AVP days when they did quad differential DAX. I'm, that was some crazy engineering, but now we didn't, we didn't have 16 channels back then either. So. Well, and one of the other things is that even a standard, like even just a standard normal, um, uh, 9018 DAC not used in a differential mode has yeah. a significantly better Synad uh, to go with that spec than this yeah, thing like is 127 dB or something, right? I don't think it's that good on that one. Um, this is that's sort of more of a mid grade chip from that company. I think it's 115 for Synad. I think the dynamic range though is over 120. If I recall. Yeah. In any case, that's better than this unit can do. It's better than any preamp processor on the market can do. So I, I think that the argument probably would be there's no reason to go with the differential DAC um, because it's not going to improve noise and over there's other noise sources basically that you'd have to address. Yeah, first exactly. And, they haven't. and I asked about that. I never got like a great answer. Um, so Shane's Quest, wondering if Shane's wondering if his audio quest, cause you know, he pimps audio quests on his channel. Will it pair well with that H damn sound, especially if he puts the batteries in? Yeah. I mean that, that'll, that'll help to offset the excessive warmness if you want. Right. <laughs> It'll add noise, that's for sure. All right. So um, let's see. Other common features. This thing got messed up a little bit, but it's, of course, Dolby Atmos, DTSX. There is no DTSX Pro. One of the issues with it is even though it is a 16-channel processor, there's, there is some limitations in how you can utilize those 16 channels. So unlike a Storm or a Trinov, it's not infinitely adjustable in terms of reassignment. Um, there's, there's some degree of reassignment. I think four of the channels can be reassigned, and that's it. Um, yeah, you can't do two sets of side channels. And, and that's, you know, in my opinion, that's a mistake a lot of these companies are making when they're doing these 16 channel processors. Think about if you're setting up a large theater that has two or three rows of seating, it's very hard to get good coverage on your the side channels, in my opinion, are the most critical surround speaker. You really need two sets of side channels if you're trying to cover three rows of seats. So I, I wish you know, I wish these guys would do it. I wish Anthem's AVM90 would have two sets of side channels. Denon used to have it on the AVP. You would able, you were able to assign two sets of side channels. Let's bring it back. You know, let's lobby for that because I'm sure there's a lot of people that are setting up massive home theaters thinking that they, they want to use this and not spend 30 grand on a 
Trent Auburn Storm because those are the only two games in town right now that offer you two sets of side channels as a configuration option. And you could decorrelate the information so you don't get comb filtering. Right, exactly. So um, unfortunately, it's not offered on any inexpensive processors that I'm aware of. If anybody knows of an inexpensive processor that correctly does dual side channels, please let us know. Inexpensive being not $18,000. So anything under, how about anything under $12,000 we'll consider yeah. inexpensive for our purposes. If anybody knows of any that do that, that, that are current, that would be good because we we don't know. Gene and I have not been able to identify one. We know that the the Denon and Morantz do not. Uh, the, the Yamaha does not. The Anthem does not. Um, I'm trying to think of others that I'm aware of. Um, I mean, the new Sony receiver has dual center channel outputs, right? So let's. Well, that's for their giant TVs. <laughs> it's a yeah. different issue. Anyway, yeah. Um, so yeah, it would be nice. And unfortunately you know, even if you add like a mini DSP, there are things you can do with it, but it doesn't have inherent decorrelation capabilities. So you could delay it, but that's not the same as decorrelation. So what you'd end up having to do is take the rear output and the side output and remix them into an extra output. And then that extra output you would, you would use essentially as your back side, you know, second set of side ones. And, and that would be somewhat decorrelated. It's the problem you have with that is there's latency in the mini DSP that's enough that it's going to screw everything up and it's going to make it a lot harder to get the distances correct, possibly yeah. impossible. I mean, if the room's small, you won't be able to get your distances set correctly for the surrounds because the latency right. far, far exceeds Oops, it. Sorry, meant to, put, meant to put the slide so you can see the words. That's the DAC board, by the way, for everybody who's curious. You can, it, I unfortunately, I took the picture with my camera. Um, and the lens has a uh, fairly short depth of field, and I should have checked it. Uh, when I was, you know, I should have set the f-stop higher and I didn't. And so uh, the caps are nice and sharp and the ESS part is is a little blurry, but that is a 9018 chipset. Um, anyway, it has DTSX, as I mentioned, no DTSX Pro, IMAX enhanced RO3D, uh, 360 reality audio from Sony. So there are, if you, it says you can hook it up to a 360 RA device. I don't even know what that is. I'd actually meant to go look that up later to find out what they're referring to. I'm assuming it's something from Sony, but then you can place playback 360 reality audio. Uh, I've heard it on headphones. It's okay. I mean, it's kind of like Dolby's headphones, you know, it's just another version of that. So I'd be curious what it would sound like on a receiver with a proper discrete multi-channel system. Hmm. He also has been updated. So Basically, a lot of the updates they had to make to this whole lineup is related to the fact that there's a lot of chips that aren't available. And so there were a lot of parts that they were making, like the Heos board, that were perfectly functional. There was nothing wrong with them. There was no reason to upgrade them. It wouldn't have changed performance, but they couldn't get key chips anymore. And so they had to redesign the boards around available current chips to keep the prices reasonable. Because buying old ones that were out of production meant paying way, way, way more for them. So they said this is now a version six for Heos, and it is more powerful, which would add future capabilities. There aren't any new capabilities beyond what I mentioned earlier, uh, but it is all new. And I believe that's common to every receiver now in what we're going to call the 800 stuff. So the 3800, 4800, 6800, and of course, the all the Marantz equivalents and the, and the Denon A1H all have this version six board, which is better. Um, so, so a question came up about why is there no DTSX Pro support if their older models, lower end models, have it? Is that do they specifically tell you that there's not going to be DTSX Pro? Uh, I don't believe any of the lower end models support DTSX Pro. Pro refers to the extra layer. They don't have enough channels to support DTSX Pro. I think he's referring to DTSX. No, there was. A, I remember them saying that they supported DTSX Pro on like uh, with the centers. With dual Maybe I have that wrong, Ben. I don't. I didn't think they supported it. Um, All right, we'll have to we'll have to go back and look at that. So that's open for debate. Yeah, I I mean the main thing that made DTSX Pro unique compared to DC, DTSX was a significantly higher channel count. None of the old receivers supported enough channels to be use of that. Hmm. I know so. it was the dual standard thing was was pretty big. Here we go. Sixteen channels and above, I think, have Pro. Yeah. But I didn't okay. think these did, but like, well, we'll find out, I guess. We'll ask. Yeah. Um, let's see. High resolution audio support. They're saying yeah, that see, I remember it. that. They, All I right. Well, maybe maybe I misunderstood yep. and it does. I think it's just the, I think it's the dual centers more than anything to have the height on the centers. Uh, but. Okay. I, I'm used to Trinov's version of Pro, which is like an entire extra layer. Right. 
Um, let's see. Oh, they have a new setup assistant. So they moved the whole menu system to the EOS, uh, Heos processor. So the Heos processor um, is significantly more powerful than the processor that would have been in, in the receivers before that would be used for things like setup and menus. So the menus were like low resolution. They're not super snappy. They couldn't put any sort of a setup assistant in there. It would have used up too much uh, processing resources that they didn't have. When they moved it over to the Heos device, which is essentially an Internet of Things processing device, it provided them everything they needed to really upgrade that. And so the setup assistant walks you through the setup by asking you questions about what you're trying to do and then making decisions for you. Of course, you can override all those, but it just makes it easier for people that don't know what they're doing. So, Matt, I'm going to interrupt you real quick because I just went on Marantz's website. Yep. And I'm going to put exactly what's on their website right here. So it says DTSX Pro or All right. 3D IMX Enhance. Sorry about that, guys. I guess I, uh, like I said, had misunderstood. Fix your right. slide. I'll fix the slide. Okay. We're never going to use these slides again. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. AL32, Josh AI. So lots of support for cool things. All right. So uh, I think everybody, somebody else had mentioned this earlier, has been wondering about Direct Live. So the Marantz and the Denon devices will support both Odyssey, which is included for free, which is part of the product, and Direct Live, which is not included for free. Direct Live comes as part of a future firmware release, but to use it, you actually have to pay for a license through Direct, and then you can use it. Direct Live is supported as the LE, that's the limited bandwidth one that's only low frequencies, I think it's like below 500 hertz, or full bandwidth. It's two different price licenses, so you can get the, the low, restricted bandwidth one, that's cheaper. I think it's like half the price or something than the full bandwidth one. So for those of you who are hoping it was going to have both included in the price, I'm sorry, that's not the way it works. It also does not include base control, and that's not currently available. And when we asked for a timeline, they did not give us one. I had heard some people say that it was in their pipeline for uh, through 2024 or something like that. I asked and they just didn't, they did not confirm that. So they may have said that at some point, but that's not what they told us at the event. They didn't say they're not doing it. They just said that, that they don't have a timeline for when. They said this is really up to Direct and working with them as a partner on how and when to introduce these new features. I also, a lot of us actually, were very curious that they would be um, having plans to introduce the new active room uh, approach. Treatment, yeah. The yeah, art. Direct came up with art. And we brought it up and they said, it's not currently in the plans. It's not something that they've talked to Direct about yet, but they're open to this and they're always willing to work with Direct on whatever they have to offer. So it sounds like there's a future potential for this, but they couldn't give us like a roadmap and say, it's coming and here's one. Hmm. So right now, I mean, if you have these units, you're going to be just using the Odyssey with the PC software pretty much. Right. Yeah. Um, and somebody asked about the timeline. I should know this. I think they said that the new firmware update comes out. I thought it was end of January. So I think the firmware was supposed to come out by now. It might, or maybe it's for February. Dirac. Yeah. I thought it was March for Dirac. Maybe you're right. I don't remember now. It's yeah. been too long. You know, it's been I don't think it's out right. I don't think it's out right now. Anyway, it's coming out relatively soon. And then you'll be able to go and get the uh, software for it. All right. So there's four discrete subwoofer outputs. Um, and you can reconfigure one of them to be a tactile base output. I wrote Gene, I'm like, so apparently this is a new feature. And he's like, they've been doing that for years. I think what I found out after that was they used to do it, then they stopped yeah. doing it. Now they're doing it again. Well, when they used to do it on the 5805, uh, the problem with if you set up the three sub configuration on the 5805 and one of them is a base shaker, it would only send LFE to that base shaker and not the other two subs. So that was like a no-go. I never used the three sub configuration like that i would always use it as a three sub mono mix that way every sub gets lfe so i'm hoping they learn from that and i'm hoping that all of the subs always get lfe but maybe that extra output is only lfe for a base shaker if you want to do that because that makes sense it makes sense if you want to have a base shaker you don't want to have your some channel base go into it you just want the really low frequency effects yeah. channel shaking your chairs if you're going to do that at all they didn't have any base shakers at the in the demo, so I we didn't get to play with it. They did show us the the setup piece in the menu, but anyway, so that's a new feature for now, new 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 old feature. Um, right. Now, you can you can configure the four base outputs in the traditional manner, where LFE goes to all four, and all the base is also redirected to the four equally. But they have this new feature. I think Gene and I are not totally sold on this, but 
we'll share it and we'll just say, I, I well, at least I'm open to trying it and seeing how it works. So you can do the new directional base approach. The way this works requires either two or four subwoofers. So you can't do it with three, obviously can't do it with one. And you can't do it with more than four because there's not enough outputs for that. So if you do two sources, you have options. You can either do left and right, or you can do front and back. And then what they're doing is they're dividing the room up into halves. So imagine- like quadrants that, basically, right? Well, that's for four, it'd be quadrants. Oh, yeah. For two, it'd be halves. So it'd be the left side of the room and the right side of the room, or the front of the room and the back of the room. What it then does is it redirects base coming from the left, center, right, surround speakers, whatever, that are closest to that half of the room in the case of two. In the case of four, it's now quadrants. And they don't support the midpoint approach that like, you know, so, so there's different ways you can do four subs. One is you could, I mean, you can put them anywhere you want, but in terms of the common ways that you would put these, you could do them in the four corners of the room, or you could put them in the middle of the front wall, middle of the back wall, middle of the side wall on the left and middle of the side wall on the right. They don't support that. So it has to be corners. And um, so if you choose four, you got to do corner placement or roughly corner placement, and then it redirects base based on quadrants. The, this is not for LFE. LFE is a mono channel, so that gets distributed as we understand it to all the channels. But mm -hmm. for the base that would normally be going to, let's say, the left speaker that then in a traditional system would get some to mono and sent out to a single subwoofer channel, in this case, it would go to this front quadrant. And the reason they were saying that is that, you know, if there's an explosion in the front left of the movie, for instance, that you would typically hear it or feel it coming from that direction. So they refer to like the directional concussive effects. I'm very dubious of this, to be honest, but. Yeah, I mean, it kind of goes against 20 or 30 years of research from Harmon about the advantages of multi-sub playing a monosum bass and being able to manipulate your room modes properly. Obviously, you can't do that if you're doing this kind of approach. So you got to determine. I guess you said it best. Do you want to have the absolute best bass smoothness, or do you want to have the more of the baseness directionality effect, which I argue is probably less noticeable below 80 hertz? I mean, the the research that I had cited mm -hmm. in the paper you're talking about that I wrote um, had actually described the effect as disappearing below 70 hertz. There mm -hmm. was. So David Greisinger had indicated he thinks that it, it maybe is meaningful still down to 50 hertz, that at least technically it should be. It, it's a subtle effect, and there hasn't been enough research to really conclusively define if 50 hertz is the cutoff or you know, 80 hertz or 70 hertz. But there is a pretty solid argument to be made that 80 hertz is low enough for directional stuff. So... You know, from so I think people have tried to move past the idea that they can hear it coming from a certain direction. I, there just isn't research to support that. I mean, there's more than 20 years. I think we're going on 50, 60 years of research oh, uh, yeah, that right. would show that you can't really tell the direction the bass is coming from from well above 80 hertz. That actually, that 80 hertz, what I the story I was told at least was that was chosen originally because it was two standard deviations below the mean frequency at which people couldn't tell the direction of bass anymore. So I think that the current argument is, well, it's not about hearing it, it's feeling it. And I'm, I'm just, I, obviously there's zero research on this, right? No, nobody's gone out and done a study where they stuck subwoofers in different areas of a room and sat people down blind and, you know, had different subwoofers go and say, where do you feel it coming from? So I can't point mm -hmm. to research that says it does or doesn't work. It's just something people are, experiencing and i've never really tried it <laughs> well and to be honest with you what i noticed matt and you probably might notice similar when you properly set up multi-sub in a room you it almost creates a virtualized sub like you can't really tell where the base is coming from right it almost sounds like it's if you have one sub you can sometimes localize where that sub is especially if you don't control the modal response of it and it's boomy and you yeah. can localize it's in the front left corner but once you set up four subs or even two really strategically placed subs properly EQ'd, the bass becomes, in my opinion, virtualized and it becomes integrated into the sound stage. And you don't really look for the direction of where the bass is coming, especially if it's crossed over at 80 Hertz or lower. So, yeah. I mean, it's nice that they gave you this option. I just hope it doesn't confuse people more than it helps people. Yeah. So now I, you're going to get people like Shane from spare change. that think every channel should have a subwoofer on it. And he's going to throw subs all over the room and say, see, I was right. Well, you might not be right, my friend. I'm sorry. More sometimes less is more. 
I, I think, yeah. I, I mean, the more subwoofer, the more low frequency sources you have, in theory, the smoother the bass could be over a wider range, but it's also that many more variables in the equation. And as a result, that much harder to, to get it right. And the less flexible the processor is, the more difficult it would be to get that right. Now, in this particular case, though, because it's not summing bass, you don't get any of that benefit. So one thing to keep in mind is that when Welty published his paper, and he talked about having more subwoofers improving the bass response and the consistency of the bass response, that assumed that the same signal was being sent to every subwoofer. When you now right, send exactly. a multi-channel signal, then that, that goes out the door. That's not true anymore. And and so you, you'll you lose that ability to have a nice, wide, smooth bass. Yeah. Well, we'll test it. Um... Matt, I'm sure you'll turn into a scientific experiment. I think we should get you the Denon flagship. I'll get the Marantz flagship. So you could do it on both and we'll, yeah. we'll see where the chips fall. Well, I have, um, I can do four subwoofers. So that's actually not a problem. I think we should bring people into our rooms, blind them to what we're doing. So one thing I was talking about new features, they have two presets and, and actually I asked for more and they said, they're going to, they're going to look into whether that's possible or not, because I, I could think of more than two presets that I would want with this. So there's a couple things you can do with it. One of them is you could do directional base and not directional base, and you could AB back and forth between the two using those presets. You also could use them to compare Dirac versus Odyssey. So instead of having to load the Dirac and listen and then unload it and load the Odyssey, you can actually go back and forth using the presets. You can do it for any number of things. I mean, the presets are basically whatever you, they're, they're like on a car when you've got a preset for your seat position and your preferred temperature and your preferred, you know, music or whatever. So you can, you can do everything with this. Um, right. So I, I actually thought, I don't, maybe they've done that before. I've never paid that close attention, but they I did. know. Yeah. They've yeah. had two presets on receivers for since 2020. Okay. And so I think that's a good idea though. I do think more would be nice. Um, so for instance, one of the things I like to do it with Dirac in particular is I like to make different target curves. So for people that are familiar with Floyd tools book, he talked a lot about the circle of confusion and the concept behind that was that there's no way for us to know. And there was never any good standards in the recording industry. Uh, for those recordings to all come out with the same kind of spectral balance so that if you have a neutral system, every recording guaranteed the sound the way it's supposed to. The problem mm. is a lot of studios had lousy speakers and they had mix engineers with lousy hearing. And so a lot of EQing was done to the sound, to the, to the music that would make it sound lousy. So some are really good, some are not. And we don't know. So what happens is to make it sound right on your system, you may end up having to adjust the highs and the lows to get things balanced more correctly. And to do that on the fly can be tricky. So making, for instance, three or four different target curves that adjust the bass and adjust the treble lets you change things up when a music, you know, everybody's heard a recording that just sounds awful. Like it's a, maybe it's a great recording, the performance was great, but just from a spectral balance standpoint, it's super bright or the bass is too much or not enough or whatever. So I like to use uh, the, the presets that you can do uh, just to be able to do that. So I would like more than two personally, like three or four, I think is a more reasonable number. Yeah. All right, let's see. Other things that we'd like to see, I already said I want more presets, uh, more bass management and flexibility. Gene and I rail about this all the time. There's a lot that we'd like to do um, that really requires more sophisticated bass management control, a lot more input output uh, reassignment basically. And it's something that tends to be unique to the Trinov and the Storm processors uh, data set, but they're hard, you know, not as popular anymore. And so um, I just would like to see it on cheaper products like this so that we could do whatever we want. One of yeah, my so imagine, imagine if you have a Denon receiver or a Marantz receiver and you plug in REW and you plug your HDMI in, and now you could sweep any channel you want. So you could sweep, you know, your tops, your front left, your center, you could, you could group channels together and make sure you're getting proper integration with your subwoofers. Um, so like on my storm, for example, and you could do this on the trend of, I'm sure I could adjust the type of slopes on my high pass and low pass filters, and I can measure each channel blended with the subwoofers to make sure I have the best transition at the 80 Hertz or whatever crossover 
point I choose. I don't always necessarily use 80 hertz for all my speakers. So if Marantz and Denon were to implement this multiplex control that you're talking about, we'd basically be able to access every channel, do sweep tones. It would just be the easiest way to set up your system, make sure everything is properly aligned as tool. There's stuff in REW you could do. You could do impulse response and stuff to make sure your speakers are properly aligned with your subs, right, Matt? Absolutely. Yeah, there's, there is a special feature for, it's a, called alignment that you can use in REW that lets you make sure that you've got the delay set uh, correctly. And so you can go and check all the channels and see if they're all aligning correctly. Typically, if you get the LCRs right, it does then align well with the surrounds as long as they're time aligned correctly. But this helps you figure that out. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, they don't uh, They don't offer that ability. They do offer that on the Storm and the Trinov where you can send any input channel to any output channel you want. So you could just take the left input channel and just have that set up in REW as it's just sending a signal to the left channel. And then you can reassign that to the outputs and just keep playing around with them. It's way better than the, currently the only way to do this is actually to use, um, uh, you have to encode them in Atmos basically, and then send it out to the respective channel. So it has to be encoded in the left, you know, Atmos, uh, center Atmos, right Atmos. The, I mean, the, some people will say, no, I thought that REW had that. It only has, it has um, multi-channel, Oh gosh, now I'm thinking I'm forgetting the name of it again. Well, there's like a beta version that allows you to do this, right? From REW where you could Well, speak it's all not the... it's not all the channels. It can't do Atmos channels because there's no Atmos encoder built into REW. So it can only do the bed layers. You can do left, center, right, LFE, and the surround channels. Um, that's it. If if now I I don't know any receiver that shows up this way, but if any receiver was to show up as simply a multi-channel sound card instead, yeah, you'd have more options, but you don't. Uh, that's not how this works typically. All right. So other things we want to see direct bass control multi-sub. Like I was super disappointed that that wasn't yeah. coming immediately. I just assumed that they were going to go right in that direction. Um, and then uh, direct art. I mean, again, I think everybody was hoping that this new Marantz would have it at least and maybe the A1H, but but they don't. And it's not necessarily coming soon. Another thing we brought up that I, I actually think this would be super cool. I, I'm going to pitch it again. They thought we were crazy to suggest this because it's like, how much stuff do you want to pack into a receiver? But Gene, remember in the old days, receivers often had video processing and yeah. sometimes it was good and sometimes it wasn't. So I think because sometimes it wasn't, they just got rid of all the video processing and largely went to switching capabilities exclusively. But the video processing did make it so that if your TV display or your projector didn't have really good uh, adjustments built in, you could just use the receiver instead to do all the color correction. Well, today... We have other needs. And so one of the big ones is dynamic tone mapping, for instance. And a lot of displays either don't have any form of dynamic tone mapping or what they have is pretty basic. So there's companies like Mad VR that have like the best on the market and they, they have tons of, of- They're expensive too. They are. Wouldn't it be cool if they were able to build in maybe like a, a watered down version of the Mad VR algorithm into the Moran so they could license it the same way they licensed Dirac or the or Odyssey or any of the others. So I think it'd be pretty cool if they would be willing to build back in some video processing capabilities, including some of the stuff that, like I said, Mad VR is doing. You and probably need like someone just saying you need a lot of processing power for it. you need like a PC level of, of processing. So, but I don't know that they couldn't do that. I mean, it, including yeah. it does have quite a bit of processing power. Kind of so. reminds me of the day back in the day when Darby was big. You remember Darby was an yeah. upscaler? The oh. Oppo, Oppo put it in their product, and and um, I think some of the receivers were putting it, and then it just kind of went away. I don't even hear anything about them anymore. So now Mad VR is the. I new think one. they never upgraded it to support 4K, and yeah, it just yeah, I don't even know if they're somebody probably knows the story. I still have one of those Darby somewhere in a box. <laughs> you can use it with your Wii. Yes. Oh, that's the thing that's missing on these products. I don't know if anybody noticed that you didn't show a back panel. There's no support for legacy video connections. There's no composite. There's no component. And that does piss me off because I still, I still rock a Wii. People still come over. We play Wii bowling. And now I'm going to have to buy a little dongle from Amazon that takes composite video and upscales into HDMI so I can plug it into this process. Well, you know what's funny, Gene? They actually explained that. They were like, yeah, we got rid of that because who needs it anymore? Nobody uses those. <laughs> and, then, and then I get back and Gene's like, so what am I going to do with my Wii? 
I was like, I didn't know anybody still had one. There's no composite video or component video on TVs anymore either. You got to buy like that little weird connector to do it. So it's like, yeah, now they're just trying to alienate vintage people like me. But yet they probably have a phono preamp on this, don't they? Oh gosh, I didn't even look. <laughs> I'm sure, they probably do. right. I don't know if, if I. I think you're right. I don't think I have a picture of the back panel for some reason. We're gonna do more um, yeah. videos on this trip. Like I said, there's some products. Yeah, I guess I didn't show the back panel. All right, we'll do that in the future one. Then we'll make sure we get the back panel to show you guys. Um, you're probably right. It probably does have a phone preamp built into it. Um, but there's there's a ton of new stuff coming, and we can't talk about what it is, but. It was funny when I, we were getting ready to go on the trip, I, I was messaging Gene and I'm like, I wonder if they're going to talk about this or that. And he's like, no, I don't think so. I think it's just going to be a couple of things. And we got there and they announced, as I said, one big thing we can't talk about, uh, the two products here, but then there was a lot of interrelated stuff and some longer term stuff they shared as well. So it sounds like there's a lot coming from Massimo Consumer. I so think it's people, actually were, pretty cool. people were predicting, I know there was some YouTube video saying, well, now that Sound United has been acquired by Massimo, they're, they're basically going to liquidate the brand and they're not going to support the audio and they're doing this to, to promote their medical stuff that so far that hasn't happened. I don't see that. I see, I see a company that's still keeping its core values by having employees that are passionate about audio. They still have separation of their divisions, whether it's Polk, definitive technology, Marantz, um, Denon, and they're still whipping out new products as quickly as they were in the past, even though there's a supply chain issue. The, you know, they found a way around that. They've come out with all new DAC chipsets on their products, so they're not relying just on the AKM stuff anymore. So they're being proactive, and they're coming out with products that are bleeding edge in terms of their HDMI connectivity. They're able to support gaming, the, the most advanced gaming options that many of their competitors can't. So I, I just say... Um, it's pretty positive from what I'm seeing so far. Would you agree? Yeah, for sure. I if I okay, so I want to start by saying they didn't tell us this. I'm just guessing by the things we heard. And as I mentioned, they did say that there was a firmware update that was made to Pios that allowed it to interconnect with their sensors. So that so the idea would be that you've got Heos devices all over your house. You know, you've got your Heos sound bar and your Heos speaker and your mm -hmm. Heos receiver, and they're all in different rooms. And the Heos devices have Bluetooth, Wi-Fi. They've got, I think it's like a one gigahertz uh, processor, like what would be in your phone, something like that. And um, what they did was they made it so that those sensors can connect through the Bluetooth link to the Heos device, which is then connected through Wi-Fi or possibly a direct network connection to the internet, which can then connect to a cloud system, which collects all the data from those sensors and that can be fed back to you for whatever you want to do. And so... My guess was that Massimo probably was saying, we want to get into people's homes. For our devices to work the way we envision them, they need to be able to connect to an ecosystem that people already have. They obviously couldn't buy Apple. They couldn't buy Google. Mm -hmm. So there weren't a lot of like relatively affordable ecosystems that they could buy to connect into. But Heos is a pretty, it's in a lot of homes. It's a pretty popular device. And as a result of that, by buying uh, Sound United, they acquired access to all of that. What that also means, though, is if they were to liquidate those brands, then they're liquidating the asset they bought because what they were buying was Heos, which are in these electronic devices being all over. They didn't just want the Heos tech. They could have invented that on their own. They specifically wanted essentially all ecosystem. of you who buy their devices. Yeah, they wanted that ecosystem. So... I don't see any evidence that there's some plan to like get rid of the audio end of things. I think if anything, they would want to strengthen the appeal for it so that they would be in even more homes so that they would have more ability to integrate their sensors. I mean, Gene, you were joking. They might, maybe they're going to like test people's heart rate when they're watching movies or I yeah. mean, there, there might be other, I don't know. Useful I mean, a, a real sinister plan is they could use that data and sell it to the, um, the movie companies, right. Or the, yeah. or the networks. So you get get a reaction out of people when they're watching Stranger Things or or um, what's the new one, the zombie one that's on HBO Max, The Last of Us. Oh, good show, weird. good show. Watch that. It's I'm three episodes in and it's enjoyable. I'm way too suggestible. I'm a, a 41 years old and I have nightmares when I watch scary movies. So I don't know <laughs> that I could do that. I like nightmares. No, no, I usually <laughs> freak out in bed and then my wife's like, "What's going on?" I'm like, "There's monsters in here." She's like, "You." 
too old for that. I did have a nightmare the first episode I watched. I'll just warn you guys. It's pretty strong. It's based on a video game. I, I've never played the video game, but my kids had. And great show. I mean, it's an Atmos, good mix. Definitely check it out. So that's it, though. I mean, that's for this slide presentation, you're pretty much wrapped up, right? Yeah. I mean, everything else that we learned, as I said, is part of some embargoed stuff we can't share yet. But I, it's cool, too. It's, you know, I think you guys will, will be interested. I think in general, what we learned is that they've got a pretty big long term plan for all these brands. I mean, I, I think you should expect to see a lot more product announcements over the next couple of years. Uh, as I said, there's a goal to try to pull Marantz up market. So I think we're mm -hmm. going to see more releases of high end up market products. Um, I think we're going to see more stuff from Denon. You know, one of the things they pointed out was that in Japan, Marantz and Denon, Denon especially, are like really high end brands. They're like considered top audiophile brands. And so you'll walk into a high end uh, two channel shop and actually see a ton of Denon stuff. And we don't get most of that here because yeah. in the US, people don't perceive Denon as being that kind of a high end brand. And they just never, you know, they actually apparently was some discussion about possibly bringing it over, getting it UL rated and everything. And when they kind of showed samples of the products off, a lot of uh, uh, dealers are basically saying, I don't know that I could sell that because people perceive Dan Denon as like mid-grade receivers, not high-end audiophile stuff. But I think some of that stuff is going to trickle over here. Like I said, in the form of higher end Moran stuff, some other stuff from Denon, there's going to be some products that will get updated. And I think that's pretty cool. I'm excited to see where that all goes. Um, I don't know how much of the things they shared we're allowed to share yet. So we'll check and then maybe release that later. And then I think, you know, there's Poke and there's um, Definitive Technology and there's Bowers and Wilkins. And so I think we're going to continue to see cool new speaker announcements from those companies as well. So I, I hope they do something with Class A too, because I love the brand. And yeah, and actually, a bunch of us brought that up. I have no idea what they're doing with Class A. They actually had yeah. some pretty cool looking, but older Class A amps in in one of the demo rooms. They were not being used; they were just sitting there. And uh, yeah, I mean, if I were them, I would maybe consider taking that AV10, maybe making some sound quality upgrades to it, make it a little bit better yet, and then sell that as a Class A surround processor you know they've got the platform already so it would just be a matter of maybe upgrading the DAC board to something better yet maybe the LCR channels become dual differential or something like that I don't know yeah and maybe they could offer like a super high powered ice edge yeah you know so, so instead of the 16 channel one they would offer like mono blocks that put out a thousand watts I'm ready for it so good product suggestion. Hopefully uh, we'll see something coming out of them next year. We have a we have plenty to cover this year. So don't ask for that too quickly because we're not going to be able to review it in time. Yep. So I see somebody mentioning about something about separates or what. So I'll just mention like the AV7706, the 8805A, like those aren't going anywhere. Um, they'll probably mm. make updates to them over the years, I would guess. But they're, you know, this is not a sign that like they're abandoning mid-grade processors. Um, and then in terms of receivers, I mean, they already make, 11 channel receivers so the whole new lineup as i said of 800 series stuff was all updated from before um a lot of it is pretty similar to what it was before just with little upgrades such as the better video board different dac board updated amplifiers that amp module i forgot to mention this that amplifier module on the denon is actually shared with all denon receivers so all of them have the same one the only reason why the lower end models have less power is they have lower rail, rail voltages on the power supply mm -hmm. it's actually the same module and on Marantz, I think, did we find out that the Cinema 40, was it, has the same Ice Edge amplifier module? Or I'm not it? sure about that yet. I thought it was linear, but then I kind of maybe misheard uh, Phil Jones. So we're going to have him on again and maybe get one of those Cinema 40s in and check that out too. So yeah. jury still out on whether or not that's Class AB or Class D. But I do think it'd be very cool if we started to see more receivers with Class D amps in it. And, and I, yeah. as much as I love Purify... And Bruno and Hypex, actually, somebody mentioned uh, the end cores are very good as well. I'm not going to complain if it ends up just being a bunch of Ice Edge. I mean, those are good modules, too. So if Marantz, for instance, ends up doing Ice Edge and all their mid to upper end receivers, I think that would be a big win. Yeah, we need that when we're getting all these high channel counts. Well, Matt, I think we're past your bedtime, so we're going to wrap this show up. Appreciate <laughs> you uh, bringing all the information here and going out on my behalf to cover this event. That was awesome. And um, hopefully we'll get to go out there again and maybe check, test that uh, spatial base feature that they're doing. 
I'd yeah. like to see if they could set up. If they could set up a demo and convince us, I'll fly out for it. So actually, we were we were vote we were asking for a different trip, and I think you would go. So, I want to go to Japan. Yeah, actually, they, have, they were talking about that. Yeah, I think that would be cool. There now, I will say the other thing that would be cool is all speaker development is not done. So they have engineering out in Carlsbad, but all the speaker engineering is actually done in I think it's Connecticut. Um, because I think definitive, definitive technology and poke were originally located kind of near each yeah. other. And so they, I think combined it anyway, that looked like a pretty cool thing too. So maybe they'd invite you and I out for that. And we could do a, a tour of that facility and see, I'm kind of more into speakers anyway. So I have to say, I think it'd be pretty cool to get out there and see how they develop speakers and look at their anechoic chamber and meet with the engineers that are there. So yeah, let's push for that. All right, we will do that. Well, Matt, appreciate all that info you dropped on us. Guys, don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audiohawks. We appreciate your support. You get direct access to us if you want to suggest video topics or ask questions. And until next time, my friends, keep listening. <laughs>